This video was created during the 2023 WGA and SAG strikes. Without the labor of the writers and actors currently on strike, Ahsoka wouldn't exist. Learn more about the strike at the link in the description. The Ahsoka credits are full of galactic maps and mysterious runes. The second I saw them, I knew I was going to try to translate them all to figure out what they said. And I did try, but quickly discovered I had no idea what I was doing. Fortunately, AJNeb97 actually has some ability and figured them all out. So I went back in and verified their translations and mapped out as many of the runes as I could and honestly had a really fun time doing it. And there are some interesting details hidden in the credits that I think will appear in Episode 3 and beyond. The credits seem to chart the journeys of some of our characters to Thrawn and Ezra's location. The first world we see is Arcana, where Ahsoka discovers the map in the Night Sister ruins. Two other planets are nearby that I can't quite make out. One might be Ierni or Nern, and the other looks like it ends with an R and two M's. Next, we move over to the Perlimian trade route, and by the way, sometimes the R rune is flipped upside down as it is here, I'm not sure why, but in this area we have Lothal and Garel. Lothal is where we spend a lot of time in the first two episodes of the series. The homeworld of Ezra Bridger, where he and Grand Admiral Thrawn were both last seen. Garel is a planet that was clearly nearby and was seen throughout Star Wars Rebels. It was a temporary base for Phoenix Squadron in the early days of the Rebellion. As we travel on, we can see Mandalore, the homeworld of Sabine Wren. It also featured prominently in the Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, and we recently saw it in live action for the first time in the Book of Boba Fett and The Mandalorian. The next screen shows us three more planets, Agamar, Dathomir, and potentially Yavin. Agamar was the site of a Star Wars Rebels episode where our heroes stumbled upon a super tactical droid and his army. Ezra was able to convince the droid that they were not his enemies, and they briefly joined forces against the Empire. Dathomir is the homeworld of the Night Sisters of Dathomir, which likely makes it the homeworld of Morgan Elsbeth. It was also the homeworld of Darth Maul, where he held a base from at least the time of Solo A Star Wars Story all the way through to Star Wars Rebels. The last planet I can't confirm with other runes, but Yavin works, and it isn't that far off from where Dathomir and Mandalore are located in the galaxy. One of Yavin's moons was the site of the rebel base in A New Hope. The next screen shows us part of the Corellian run with four planets, Corellia, Cato Nemoidia, Duro, and Pasana. Corellia we see in the second episode. It was a shipyard planet and the homeworld of Han Solo. Duro is a planet that has classically been near Corellia in maps of the Star Wars galaxy. It was the home of the Duros people. Cato Nemoidia was a colony of the Trade Federation during the Clone Wars that was seen during the Order 66 sequence in Revenge of the Sith. Also, Anakin may or may not have saved Obi-Wan's life there. He thinks it shouldn't count, but you can read about it in the book Brotherhood by Mike Chen and decide for yourself. Pasana was the desert world first seen in The Rise of Skywalker. I think it was included here for the same reason as Duro, Cato Nemoidia, Agamar, Yavin, and Garel. It just happens to be nearby a planet that's relevant to the story, so why not toss it on the map? Then we cut over to Coruscant, I think. It's a little hard to make those runes out, but it does look like a busy and central system. We know New Republic officials will be making an appearance in this show, so Coruscant makes sense to include. Maybe some of our characters will even visit the planet. As we near the end of the journey, we zip over to Setos. That's a new planet that first appeared in the second episode of the series and serves as a reflex point for the map leading to Thrawn. Kello Rin on Twitter pointed out that the planet's name is awfully close to Cetus, a mythological sea monster from Greek mythology which was probably inspired by real-world whales. The planet in the credits has a pergil flying around it, which is a giant space whale that's able to travel through hyperspace naturally. Those creatures are responsible for Thrawn's exile in Star Wars Rebels. We recently saw them in live action in The Mandalorian, and you can barely see the shadow of one in the clouds above Setos. We also know from the trailers for the series we're going to see them up close and personal. I think Cetos is where the journey to Thrawn's galaxy will begin, but I don't think we'll get there right away because we have two more planets to pass through. Odin, spelled with a Y, is first up, which might be a moon just based on how it's shaped. Considering Balin's skull and Shin Hati are named after wolves from Norse mythology, I imagine Odin is a continuation of that. Even the runes throughout the credits remind me more of Nordic runes than they do the Urkatat runic language of Star Wars. I don't know the final rune for the other nearby planet, but the word ends with U-N-N-A. There was a Norse goddess named Yidun, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but she was the goddess of youth, the rejuvenating one. That could have some mythological importance for our characters. In Old Norse, Anna means to love. Kunna means to know or to understand. That first rune could be an X or a Z, with the pronunciation being Zunna, which is close to Sunna, which is another name for Sol, the Norse god of the sun. And in Norse mythology, Sol was chased by the wolf Skull. At this point, I'm grasping at straws, 
cause, but that feels like a pretty solid connection. The final stop on our journey is Paradia. Balin mentioned the pathway to Paradia, and I guess this is where Thrawn is in exile. This is a new planet, and I don't think it has any mythological significance, but the prefix peri in Greek means around, about, or beyond, which I think is pretty cool. Dia can mean god or deity. I'm expecting we will find something wild out in this other galaxy. Maybe it's whatever is whispering to Elsbeth, because right now I do not think that's Thrawn. Zooming out, let's take a look at the journey the credits are charting. We don't know where Arcana is, so we'll go from Lothal to Mandalore to Dathomir to Corellia to Coruscant. And we don't know where Cetos is yet, but we know it's in the Danab system, and now I'm going to use some Legends information, but that was in the Sluis sector of space, so Cetos might be near Dagobah, Mustafar, and Utapau. I love that the credits emphasize the long journey from Cetos to Paradia, and it's interesting that throughout we can see several lines diverging and converging again. Seven lines join up in Paradia. Maybe they represent different characters or groups. Ahsoka, Sabine, Morgan, Balin, Shin, Marak, and maybe Hera? I might be reading too much into things there. I think we're just supposed to get a sense that several people are part of the race to find Thrawn and Ezra. But that's all I've got from the credits. I really loved dissecting them and digging into some real-world mythology to see how it might inform Star Wars. I also wonder if the credits might change over the course of the series. Maybe as we visit more planets and get into a new galaxy, we'll have more to discuss. That would be awesome. But I'm done for now. Let me know if you have any theories about this in the comments. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel for our continuing Ahsoka coverage, follow us on our socials, and consider checking out our Patreon page for video reactions and audio commentaries for every episode as they release. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.